Welcome to Leadership Level Up. I'm Brian Prairie. And I'm Dr. Jeff Williamson. I am just starting my leadership journey. And I've been guiding leaders for 30 years. Our podcast aims to shine a spotlight on outstanding leaders and provide a platform for them to describe their leadership journey and share the guiding principles that have helped them become great leaders. Welcome to Leadership Level Up Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Williamson. I'm here today with our friend, Bill Gertin, who has been here before with us and always enjoy our conversations. Welcome back, Bill. Same. Thank you for having me back. So in some of our past conversations, we talked about your um, your work history, people that have influenced you, leadership impact over the years. And uh, we touched some in that conversation about your work in sports sales. Yeah. But I'd love to hear more about that, um, the work that you're doing with a variety of professional leagues, as well as something called ISBI 360. And yeah. I'll, I'll put that little teaser out there so <laughs> you can tell us uh, all about that. So I'd love to dive into that and hear a little bit more now from your sales experience and some of the work that you've done in that area. Well, as a sales manager, I had the privilege of running the sales department here locally at WKAN for several years. And, and it was the iPod oddly enough, that got me out of this because I saw a thousand songs in your pocket being the biggest single detriment to local radio that could have ever been invented. Why would you need to listen to local radio if you could put a thousand songs in your pocket? Well, I was wrong, but it allowed me to really think deeply about what was my next iteration of of what I really wanted to do. And part of that was I wanted to be a published author really big into that publish author. Yeah. Tell us about that. Wanted to be a big speaker as well, but I did, Mm -hmm. I I put together a list of these goals that I wanted to achieve. And so in moving forward with that, discussed it with several friends, one of whom was Andy Corbis, who you know well, who we then co-authored my first book called Reality Sells. Mm -hmm. And then I began thinking, gosh, I really feel pretty good about this entrepreneurial kind of a, a spirit. And so I, I thought I wanted to speak a little bit more and get out and do that. Well, Jeff Hammes at the time, gracious guy that he is, had he me is. over to his home for a dinner party. Mm-hmm. We began talking about him just about to take over the bank. And he was wanting to train more about customer service. And he said he's got this book and he wanted to train it, but he didn't know who to call to be able to do that. And I said, well, Jeff, I'd really like to try that. I had a suggestion. And he said, you would. He said, well, so he gave me the book. He mm-hmm. says, take a look at it and see if that's mm-hmm. something you'd want to do. He still likes to do that, by the oh, way. It, it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. So he allowed me that opportunity to train the bank. And so all of the employees at the bank went through this program, which I created from this, this six-page recipe book in mm-hmm. the back of the book. Mm-hmm. And we got done. And six months later, we're sitting down. I said, Jeff, I'd like to do a little bit more of this. And Jeff looked right at me and said, man, I thought you'd never ask. You have a real gift for this. Yeah. But you can't see any other banks for a year. You understand? <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. Just sign right. right here. Exclusivity clause. <laughs> yeah. No problem. So that was really the beginning of this speaking mm-hmm. career. And so as many speakers go, there's a, a an opportunity for you to become a generalist to right. start. But then you become familiar with what really resonates with people. And then you become a specialist. And so they say, get rich in your niche is what they really mean. And that's to be very deep in Mm -hmm. a particular element and go really deep within that industry. And so I chose to go very deep into the ticket sales departments of professional sports teams and begin to train their ticket salespeople on specific sales techniques in sports. And so the first gig I had was with the Chicago Bulls and very fortunate to this day, now after having done over 100 different teams in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. That's amazing. But to have to have been given that opportunity at the beginning from a world-class organization yeah. and then to use that as a springboard to go to many other places has been a gift that I could never, mm-hmm. ever repay fully. Yeah. So now I've had the chance to do that. And about seven years ago, I was approached by a colleague who said, gosh, we got to put you on tape somehow. Mm-hmm. I said, well, that'd be nice. Then I wouldn't have to travel as much. And I could be in 10 places at once instead sure. of one. Sure. And so we recorded uh, a multi-level program in micro learning bites of 10 minutes or less. I love that. We called the company Inspiration Sports Business Institute, or ISBI 360 for short. And we began marketing these training programs, mainly for ticket sales to sports teams that were in need of a cost-effective way in which to train their people. And so that business has grown to include a recruitment angle and an actual virtual ticket sales group angle. And so we now have 
three different branches of this company and 12 employees and uh, you know, That's we're growing exciting. it and doing well. It's it's a new venture for me. Yeah. Uh, but I have terrific people that I work with, and and so everyone does their part, and it's uh, it's working well. I think it's so fun too because you're passionate, obviously, about that area in general and working with with sports teams um, to then take that and and scale that up. I mean, yeah. hello, entrepreneurs. <laughs> you know, th- this is this is how it can happen is to. Yeah really find something that you're passionate about, that you're gifted in, and then you do the hard work to really get excellent and outstanding in those areas. But I also recognize that I couldn't do it all. Right. And I think as an entrepreneur, we get to that point where Mm -hmm. there's this brick wall of time Mm -hmm. and effort that you'll only have so much. And where can the additional resources or energy or somehow multiplicity come from. That's right. And so the partner that I ended up with is a former NFL executive, former MLS guy who's been at the forefront of big, big deals. And frankly, I didn't think big enough. I was a guy who was kind of real happy to kind of be from where I am and do what I do. And, and his vision is far grander. And so it was that piece I had lacked. Mm-hmm. And so the two of us have grown this thing to now have several partners and it has become a, a, a real enterprise. So yeah. it's kind of neat to find the people that aren't what you are and to collaborate in some way that everyone wins. Yeah. And I love that because it goes back to that idea that we don't all have to, we don't have to be great at everything. We can be really great at a few things and That's then right. find other people that are excelling in areas that we might not be so solid and that we can basically rent their gifts, talents, and strengths to help do some things together that are, that are really amazing. One of the things that, that I often talk about um, is this concept of the isolation of leaders. And, and I think you really touched on that because as a solopreneur Mm -hmm. for a lot of years, until you started building team and involving other people to build out the business, there and I felt that too, you know. It's just like, well, there's me, myself, and I, and how are we going to get this done? And but that mindset can lead us to a sense of isolation where we don't connect with other people as much and we don't rely on other people to do things in this venture. So I love how the development ISBI 360 was some of that of going, Hey, we can do more than I can do. Yes. And I needed some convincing to do yeah. that. It wasn't necessarily my idea. hundred percent. It was really his saying, Hey, you know, this could be really big if you know, you were to be able to drop some of what you're doing and, and put your all into Refocus this. your yeah. energies. Yeah. Well, I can remember, uh, this is years back of us having a coffee together at Starbucks and you talking about this new thing that was, you know, in, engaging video and sales training and virtual. And that was, that's so fun to look back on that because that's, this is what you were talking about. It's just, exactly what's happening. it's, it's even better now and more developed. So when COVID hit, without anyone to train, we had to figure out what to do next with this asset we had, this Think training fast. thing. Mm-hmm. And so what we did was hired dozens of people who had been let go from ticket sales, put them in our system, trained them up using our product, the training, so you don't use it, you lose it sometimes in sales. And then we began to rent them out to people who could not afford full-time staff, but now had tickets to sell post-pandemic. And right. so it became an entirely different segment of our audience. And uh, and now is it in, in probably at this point, if I had to do the numbers, maybe the, the most profitable part of our business right now. And see, I love that because you took a really difficult situation and engaged other people. Again, going back to like building this team, going, you engaged mm-hmm. other people who were in need of employment and help them get better and then simultaneously built your own brand because yeah. I'm telling you, right, when these folks are back out and working for other organizations and they remember, hey, when things were low tide here, uh, we worked with Bill and his organization and really developed some skills. They invested in us. And guess who I think they'll call whenever they need help or, right. or guidance or training. Yep. So it just reinforces that reality that I've always believed in is that, you know, when we invest in other people, even if we don't invest in them for that to come back to us, it still comes back to us. Yeah. And we're blessed by those efforts to say, Hey, this is a, this is a strange situation. We've got something that might be helpful to you. Yeah. And there's so much that's unfolded from that too, because of some of the the things that I had gotten to know from others in the industry that are now not in the sports industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, A group of heating and air conditioning contractors down in Florida has called me to do training for them. 
and a home warranty by a home buyer's warranty company and some others. So I've been able to take some of the things that I've done. And now post pandemic, when these people have left the sports industry and gone somewhere else, they had remembered, gosh, Bill's our guy. Can, can we exactly. work again? And so yeah. that's the sort of stuff that I've been very graced yeah. to have now come yeah. my way. Yeah. I often say relationships are everything. And so those people who you have forged a relationship with and built yeah. that trust with, yeah. And it goes across industries. And as you know, the, the transferability of good sales approaches that involves relationship development and trust and all those kinds of things that we, we value. Um, you start seeing new plant life popping up in places well, you didn't foresee. Maybe. And that's the one thing I didn't expect when I left radio. Really? I really felt as though all the stuff that I learned in radio was only applicable to mm. radio. So all those entrepreneurs out there that don't know exactly whether or not your stuff <laughs> applies, it applies. Yeah. I thought I'd die an old radio guy. Mm. And when I learned that the skills that I had learned from that were very transferable to other media or other places, uh, my mind just expanded to all kinds of places. Yeah, I think that's such a great lesson. It's probably one of the benefits that you and I and others have from this, as I say, this not being our first rodeo, <laughs> is that I really can now see that transferability of so many things. I literally yeah. just prior to, to us coming here, I was was meeting with one of my coaching clients and we were talking about that transferability from this industry to a prospective industry that was different right. to say, oh my goodness, yeah, this and this and this and these skill sets, those are needed in every profession. But it's easy for us to just think, oh, I'm only in radio mm -hmm. or I'm only in whatever area when we we get to bring those things with us. Yes, we do. That, that's the great news. Um, because, yeah, you, we think, oh, I suppose I'm leaving that industry. I'm probably leaving all that behind. Well, and we don't. Every industry needs creativity. They need writing skills. They need salesmanship. Um, all of those things yeah. are immediately transferable to right, something else. Right, right. All the, across the realm of communication. I often mm -hmm. laugh when people will say, so you do training and teaching and speaking. What, what, do, you, what do people have you do training on? And I'm like... <laughs> communication. And then I chuckle and say, I've been doing this for 25, 30 years, and I guess we'll never get it right because yeah. people keep asking for help. And it's, a, it's similar for it's you. It's a bottomless pit of need, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. for those yeah. who train it. We yeah. always need it. And it's like, well, you know, I love doing it and we keep needing to get better at it. So we help people mm. as much as we can. But Indeed. those are areas that are valuable across every profession. And yeah. I know you understand that. You bet. One of the things too is, is this idea of authentic leaders. And um, when we were talking in the past about uh, someone needing to kind of straighten us out a little bit early on in our careers, um, I, there was a time I'm not proud of, but I thought to be absolutely successful at the level that I desire, I have to be perfect, mm -hmm. nearly perfect. And so those moments of reality when it wasn't that came often, those are, can be really, really unsettling. And I think one of the things that I'm grateful for as the years have gone by is that I've learned about being an authentic leader yeah. and not attaching my success or even my affinity to have a connected team to me being perfect and always doing the right thing. I, I, I struggle with that. I, I, I'm a recovering perfectionist, <laughs> I'll often say. But authentic leadership doesn't mean we're perfect. And, and I, I'm guessing you've had some, some experiences and insights in that area too. Perfection, Jeff, yeah. is exhausting. It, it is. And it, it is allows- For everybody. Well, it, everybody. For everybody. Correct. There is a, a fallacy of perfection yeah. that some leaders, when they get into the chair, mm -hmm. feel as though they have to perform mm -hmm. to be able to be each day. Yeah. And you go home drained, exhausted mm -hmm. because of this person that others believe you to be. The very best leaders that I've ever known have been those who are willing to be on, to allow the, the pressure to be spread around mm -hmm. for them to let others know that they don't have all the answers, that they will be as transparent as possible in allowing others the freedom they need to help collectively get where we need to go and to not be the high and mighty individual that has to lord over everyone and make the final decision. Right. Certainly decisions need to be made. Somebody sure. may need to be the final say, but it's not without careful consideration of everyone mm -hmm. and their viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Perfection is unattainable. Yeah. Those who work for someone 
want to know that they're really okay than saying, I mm -hmm. was wrong mm -hmm. on this, or mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily bring us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. For those who work for others who always think they're right, that's also exhausting. It is. And leads to high turnover, high right. stress, more cost to a company because you now have to recruit more people in, and it doesn't benefit anyone. Transparency actually saves money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I was thinking of your reference earlier to uh, leaders who allowed you to fail. <laughs> but then extended grace to you when you did. Yeah. And I think that is so key to this conversation about seeking perfection or the myth of perfection is that when we have an authentic leader who understands that mm -hmm. and, and lets us know that they are going to fail sometimes and, and has the courage and the humility to say, Bill, I thought this was going to go so well. And I just got to tell you, I'm so sorry because I missed the mark in performing the way Jeff meant to, you know, well, if that's the case, then people go, oh, my supervisor is willing to say I was, I made a mistake or I was wrong about this. Maybe that means I have space as a team member to make mistakes and then find grace and, yeah. and you're like, well, let's try it. What, how can we do that differently next time? Let's talk about that. Yes. And here's what leaders probably see, but may not think about most often. When that behavior is witnessed, yep. you then become the purveyor of the next generation of leaders. And it may not be far off. It may be a year or two right. away. So I say next generation somewhat collectively. If you do it right, Mm -hmm. There is more of a propensity for those mm -hmm. who are watching you mm -hmm. to do it right as well, just yeah. as I have been privy to doing that in my own career and as you. Have. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I realized along the way was that I, I think part of the reason I wanted to always do the right thing was because honestly, I want, I've always wanted my teams to really like me. I've always wanted them to think he's the best, right? And that can be a, a thin line between being loved and appreciated and just wanting people to think you're everything. But um, in that desire to have a team that's close, that trusts each other, that's for each other, that enjoys working together, at least most of the time, what, what I realize is then when, when we're authentic and when we're human and we say, gosh, I, I don't, I don't have all the answers. What do you guys think? You know, I'm not sure where to go with this. I'll have to make the decision, but talk me through two, three different scenarios because I want to hear from you. Right. That's when we start having that close connected team, not because they think we always have the right answers, but because we're human and we're authentic as leaders to let them be a part of what we're trying to do together. That's right. Yep. So I wanted to give you a chance here down the home stretch to, to talk about some things that, that you're looking forward to. I know mm -hmm. you had mentioned your speaking career. That's something you've really developed, especially in recent years more so. And uh, the Legacy Leaders Group, I want to hear more about that, please. Yeah, let me, I'll start with the, the speaking stuff because it really was born from the pandemic and the fact that I needed something else beyond training to be able to be able to survive. And it became apparent to me that I was doing research for the last many years. I had notebooks and things of people I was training, young people typically in sports, that wish to be a part of the organization. It's a young man's job. It's mm -hmm. a pretty involved mm -hmm. thing to be there at 41 home games a year if you're right. football, uh, basketball, yeah. 81 home games if you're baseball. Mm -hmm. And the ability that someone has to succeed in that role, having the same amount of skills and abilities as someone else who doesn't make it. And I wanted to find what were those qualities that happened. And so I did, in doing the research, seven things kept popping up. Things that were all based in fear, but all that had very specific things, comparison and regret and heartbreak sometimes mm -hmm. and failure. Mm -hmm. And there were seven that came up. And so in these seven buckets, uh, there were what I called the seven voices in your head which I have created a very involving and engaging multimedia keynote experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it began online because they needed to be online because nobody was doing live events. We were all sitting in front of our computers with and, our cameras on. And so I <laughs> yeah. created a very involved waveform kind of thing where the voices were actually talking to me back and forth. And so it was a, a very engaging Zoom screen sort of experience. And so now that live is back in a big way, 
uh, that has transferred to the live stage very, very well. And so I'm, I'm looking Exciting. forward to doing much more of the seven voices in your head moving forward oh, to be able to overcome That's those limiting beliefs right. and overcome some of the positive mental health issues that we've now uh, been uh, mm. faced with now in our society. Man, I'd love to come and hang out with you next time you do that live somewhere around here in Chicago land. That fun sounds exciting. I'll have you along. I'll let that you know. That would be cool. I would love that. I'm, I'm a learner, so I'm always <laughs> excited to hear new new content from, from people that I respect. So the other thing that um, we had talked some about besides the seven voices in your speaking career was the legacy leaders group that you've started developing. And I thought that was just a fascinating model and opportunity. So I, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? The conversations I had with my sports colleagues during the pandemic were very heartfelt and very worrisome, frankly, to me, because they needed a place to talk about stuff they can't talk about at work. Things about their mental health. What is it that they, in this stage of their lives, and these are mainly people in their 50s, early 60s, who have had a career in sports that now may not be looking necessarily for the next rung on the ladder as it is what's next for me beyond sports. What should I be doing now to prepare for that? What sort of things in investing or philanthropy or uh, perhaps on a health and wellness perspective? Mm -hmm. What should I be thinking about now? Next chapter questions. Yes, and moving forward with that. And so there has never been a place in sports for, a, for people to talk openly about that without fear of retribution or having someone over their shoulder taking notes for the next issue of Sports Business Journal because of the level at which these people are. And so I created these uh, called the Legacy Leaders Inner Circle, which is a small cadre of those within sports and entertainment to get together literally to discuss those kinds of things mm -hmm. that just aren't spoken about much in the boardrooms of sports and entertainment. So when you brought those groups together to have those kind of next chapter, real life, legacy kind of conversations. What did those look like when those groups come together? Are you meeting in person again, I'm guessing, well, now that we can? Our or first is it one, a mix? We will have our first one coming up later this year. Okay. Uh, but all of them have been online, and they've all been interview-based with someone in particular from the industry mm -hmm. who has a fascinating story to tell mm -hmm. or some insight uh, of transparency on their own that mm -hmm. they are sharing. And mm -hmm. so the conversations that take place back and forth with the Q&A mm -hmm. have been fascinating. And they're mm -hmm. people that are extremely well known within the sports and entertainment mm -hmm. industry. People mm -hmm. like Scott O'Neill, who mm -hmm. is the now the CEO of, of I'm going to get it wrong, Wizard Entertainments. I believe it's an enormous worldwide company, but he was a uh, former president and CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports, which owned the Philadelphia 76ers, mm -hmm. the New Jersey Devil, and several other teams. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had Mike Vec on, mm -hmm. a pioneering baseball legend, and, and, and his father, uh, Bill, Bill Vec, the yeah. owner of the White Sox. Uh, terrific guy. Paul Epstein, a former uh, executive within sports who now is a motivational speaker and speaks mm -hmm. on goal setting. Mm -hmm. uh, many other people like that who have really a lot to share. And so this group, I think, will really have a lasting value far mm -hmm. beyond where I will be mm -hmm. in sports. And that was mm -hmm. my goal. Well, that's such a cool model because you, you think across dozens and dozens of industries like that, different than that, where um, women and men are maybe in the last 15, 20 years of their traditional working years, and they're asking themselves, what's next? Mm -hmm. And I love what I've done, but what's next? And then we think about those next chapters. Man, we could have a whole future conversation just about that. It, the entire organization is revolving around three things, discovery, innovation, and collaboration. I love it. And it's incredibly powerful and has yet to really re re get to that power yet because it's still in the infancy. And so that's part of my day is yeah. every day to make sure that grows a little bigger. Well, that's exciting. So I'll, I'll look forward to hearing future reports on this first gathering at Legacy Leaders Group. You bet. And uh, we'll look forward to future conversations with you. Appreciate you coming back on and joining us on Leadership Level Up podcast. It was my privilege to be part of it, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks again to Bill Gertine for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Leadership Level Up. Please subscribe so you don't miss future conversations with great leaders. Also be sure to follow Converge on LinkedIn, Facebook, and at Converge Group LLC on Instagram.